Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. Today's episode, we've got Mr. Richard Niles, who is an amazing string arranger. Probably most notably, at least for me, Grace Jones' Slave to the Rhythm, but also, of course, Tina Turner, Ray Charles, Anita Baker, you name it. An incredible old Pet Shop Boys. He's also a composer, credible jazz guitar player, and an all-round wonderful guy, and an educator. Has written tons and tons of books on music and music theory. This is not one to be missed. Stay tuned. Watch the wonderful Mr. Richard Niles talk about his journey. Where did you grow up? I don't think I know that. Where did you grow up? I grew up pretty much uh, about three minutes down the hill. I spent mo most wow. of my child in my grandmother's house. You know, I, I love this area and I love the smell of it, you know, the eucalyptus trees. So this sure. is very homey to me. Hummingbirds, squirrels. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. the whole thing. Yeah, it was yeah. great. Lack so of snakes. <laughs> my uh, father uh, was Tony Romano. He was a singer, songwriter, vocal arranger, worked with Bob Hope, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, those cats. And so I was brought up on that music uh, all, all through my childhood. Incredible. And, and, and I had, you know, great jazz musicians playing in my house with my dad. They'd come over and have jam sessions all the time. And so that was a wonderful thing. So I not only, I mean, obviously I had, you know, most people say, oh, I would listen to my mother's record collection. I just listen to my dad play. I was thinking the same thing because yeah. I grew up on classical and jazz music. That's all my father would play. Right. I was, li yeah. You so, were listening to the people that made those records yeah, that yeah. I was listening to. Yeah, and it was fantastic. And I, I even remember going over, uh, 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 you know, f to, to have a pool afternoon with Bing Crosby and his kids, you know. So I, re you know, when my small childhood, I remember those things. My mother and father divorced, and my mother remarried a, a screenwriter Jesse Lasky Jr. And so they took me to London, and and I was very how lucky. old were you? I was uh, eleven at that point, and I had the advantage of that background. Uh, in language, in the use of language, uh, Jesse was a fantastic poet and very, very uh, highly educated and, and brilliant and funny, hysterically funny. And so I had that wonderful uh, combination of uh, language and music. And then growing up in London, I went to London in 1962. Great time to be there. I was only little, but but let me tell you, the Beatles hit me in the forehead, and then I would go out as a little kid, and I don't know how I got into these clubs, but I'd go to places like the Marquee Club, Tiles, all of these London clubs, and see groups like 10 Years After, The Who, uh, the Graham Bond Organization, uh, all those six years, I, I saw the very first tryout gig of Cream in a little club in uh, Ryslip, mm. uh, you know, and there were these three guys getting up on stage and my friend who I was with, you know, we used to go out all the time to these clubs and he said, wait a minute, that's Ginger Baker sitting up. And I said, no, it can't be. Come on, we're in Ryslip. This is, no, this is, and it was a local blues club. And he said, wait a minute, that's Jack Bruce whipping out his bass. And, that's Eric Clarence. And that's what it was. And they played their very first tryout gig. I mean, it was, I was all of 15, you know. I, I've told many people this, never on camera, but that, you know, 15 in England is basically, or the UK is basically 18 oh, yeah. everywhere else. Oh, yeah, I True. was going into pubs of 15. Very much so. I'm, yeah. I'm sure you were, yeah. And if it you were tall enough, normal. if you were tall enough, you did. But, yeah. but I just, you know, I was happy to be able to, you know, the guy would let me into tiles, for instance. And it, that was a pretty raucous place. You know, sure. that was that. And, and I'd go there to see The Who because there was nothing like seeing Who in a club. So the, the guy would say, okay, you, you can go in, but just stand at the back and don't get in any trouble because it gets kind of crazy. And they were all, you know, what they did on stage. And, and uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't quite uh, the thing where they throw themselves into the stage, but it was a lot of stuff. So it was a great environment to grow up. So, so I had the combination between the love of the rock and the creative stuff that was going on in the 60s and the love of jazz and all the music that I knew 
Ella Fitzgerald, Sinatra, whatever. So, so it was a great, great combination set up for me. What was your musical education? Not from the perspective of being around the great music. What was the, you know, did you start on, I know you're a great guitar player. Did you start as a guitarist? Oddly enough, well, I tell this story. In fact, my, my mother wasn't very keen on me being a guitarist because my father was a great guitarist. Ah. And so there was like, you know, you shouldn't waste your time with that. You should, <laughs> you should be going to school and, and, you know, you should become a lawyer. Don't go into show business. So throughout my teens, when I was about, I believe it was about uh, 13 or 14, I actually bought a guitar from a friend of mine uh, who lived in uh, St. John's Wood. And I bought it for four pounds. It was a sort of a classical guitar, very cheap one, extremely cheap. And I hid it under my bed and I got away with that for about three years. Oh, incredible. I, it's unbelievable that I got away Did with it. Did you just wait for, till she left the house and then you'd practice? My mother and stepfather would go out every, almost every night for social engagements. The 60s in London. It was Sounds the 60s like in thing London. They were in show business, film business. They were writing TV shows like The Avengers, The Saint, Danger Man, Crazy. those kinds of shows. So they were busy. And so, yeah, and so I had time to, and I just learned to play. I had one of those nice little box record players, you know, whatever they're called. And, and uh, you know, I'd put on the record and I'd try to figure out what, what it was. And uh, that's how I learned it first, which wasn't learning much. But I could, I found that uh, orally I could get around the chords. I understood the movements of the chords by ear, I you know I understood you know two five one because I would sing it, bah, 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 and I and I would play what I could sing, but then I formed a band when I got out of high school, uh, and I toured for two years with this band called Pure Wings. Pure Wings. Pure Wings, and it was actually we played on this crazy tour <laughs> with uh, it was called the Head Rock Circus. And it was an idea to put a bunch of bands on a kind of a variety show thing. We played with the Pink Fairies, uh, Alexis Corner, all these cats, you know, the O.C. Bisa. That was the, that was the lineup and our band. And uh, we were kind of like a folk jazz thing. With uh, We had a great violinist called Jerry Field who was... He had played with Gong. I don't know if you know who they of course were. I know. Yeah, Pierre so, Moulin. Yeah, yeah, and, that's uh, right. David Allen. And, those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah he was. He well. had been in Paris and played with those guys and was gigging around. Then he came to London, and I just happened to meet him, and we hit it off, you know. And suddenly it was like my dad used to play with Joe Venuti. So when I started playing with him, I knew what to do. So that was great. We did that for two years, and. Uh, didn't really starve, but we didn't, you know, we weren't re making money. And then I decided, I just really have to study. I wanted to study more than anything. So the only place to go then was the Berklee College of Music. And that's because uh, one of my favorite artists was Gary Burton. I loved what he was doing with his band because he was the first guy actually to do the fusion of jazz and rock. A lot of other people take credit for it, but he predated Miles Davis in that thing by about four months <laughs> yeah, because he came out with this record called Tennessee Firebird, which was kind of a... And man, I just loved what he was doing and I wanted to go any place. And he was teaching there. So I thought, okay. So then I had... Ah. Yeah. So I had those two years to, uh, uh, to want to do it. And then I went to Berkeley and I was there for four years studying with Gary Burton, Michael Gibbs, Pat Metheny, Herb Pomeroy. I mean, just... I could not. Pat was teaching there. That Pat period? was teaching. Pat came there in 1974. I was there 71 to 75, and so Pat was brought in by uh, Gary Burton at that time. I mean, everybody knows the story now, but Pat walked up to him at a concert and just said, "I want to play with you," and he was 17 or something. Gary said he was so shocked he let him do it, and he, of course he was he knew all the tunes he was burning on it. So. That's the story. Then anyway, he came in to teach, and I was so lucky to, you know, we became friends, and we had a lot of stuff to talk about compositionally, too. So that was a tremendous experience, and the, the great South African composer, Michael Gibbs, that was mind-blowing to study with him, and just a wonderful guy. So I, was, I could not possibly be luckier than, than I was. It's my feeling that Berkeley in the 70s was just on fire. 
so many incredible musicians, well, composers from that. One of my classmates was Mike Stern. Mm -hmm. uh, another one of my classmates. You're under was arrest, a, talking a, miles. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And the, exactly. And another one of my classmates was this fantastic uh, jazz uh, guitarist called Jay Azalina, who was with Spyro Gyra mm -hmm. uh, later on. And it, just wonderful people, you know, great, great people, great writers. Uh, Rob Mounsey was at the school when I was there. I could not have been in a better better environment because the great thing about Berkeley was I think uh, music education has become very formalized mm -hmm. at this point. And it's a, it's a shame because they're churning out kind of clone musicians for the most part. But in those days, one of the great uh, pieces of advice from Herb Pomeroy, who was the guy who taught... Uh, the the more sophisticated jazz arranging. He taught a Duke Ellington course and all this stuff. And he said to me, I'm giving you the techniques, but you have to do with those techniques what you want to do. So the 70s in Berkeley, um, I mean, an incredible time. But as you were sort of touching on a second ago, there's a lot to do with the fact that everything was still new, the yes. blending of all these different genres. Right. And and here's the thing that I think is is so important about that. The intent of musicians was to express themselves mm -hmm. or to express the spirit of the times, the zeitgeist. Hey, guys, yeah, zeitgeist. But it didn't mean that everybody expressed the same thing. Um, and what I loved about the 60s and the 70s was that Bob Dylan did not sound like The Who, and The Who didn't sound like Frank Zappa. And, you know, I mean, there was such variety, and they were all successful. And the great thing about England that I think you and I benefited from was the fact that the, um, the radio, Radio 1 played everything. They didn't, Had to. They didn't have radio formatting. And radio One formatting... One time zone. Yeah. They just played everything because it was all, and, and so you'd get six different styles on six different records. Sure. But we don't have that now. What you have is very rigid, I would say, fascist radio programming. So you have to fit into a format or uh, you're dead. And, and that is really a, a sad thing. Right. And, and so our intent, all musicians' intent, was to do something a little different, their own thing. You know, I like cheesecake. I like fudge. I like, you could do that. And nobody put you down for it or said, oh, that's not commercial. You can't do that. And that was the wonderful thing. And I was so lucky to come into the music business at a time when that was true because I came out of the Berkeley educational thing with all these amazing music and amazing musicians and great mentoring. And, and suddenly I'm in London and so you I moved back to immediately. I, I moved back immediately. Okay. And the very first thing that I did was I said to my parents, I'm going to New York. You know, that was seemed the place to be was either in New York or LA. So I was going to go. So I said, I'm going to New York because I, I like the vibe there and I'm, that's where I'm going to start myself in the music business and whatever. I had this kind of dream about the Brill Building and all that stuff. And I, I really only wanted to be a songwriter. That was what really excited me. And I wanted to arrange because I wanted to be able to make the best recording of my songs. I remember my mother said to me, well, if you're going to do that, why not at least just go to at least see a few people in London? London isn't, isn't exactly the worst place in the world for music. So I, I made a list of 25 companies, and I think this will show people what kind of person I am. I just made a list of 25 companies and I went to see each one of them. And 24 of them told me to piss off. Very, <laughs> very, very politely, but they told me to piss off. And one guy uh, who was a uh, professional manager at Essex Music, mm -hmm. he liked some, some of the little, you know, low quality tapes that I showed, played him of my music. And he also was a jazz guy. So he said, you really need to meet some of my mu musicians who I use and hang out with. You, you, got, you would get on really well with them. And, and he said, apart from that, also, I like this idea that you have about a musical. 
So if you ever write anything on that, please come back. So I came back four weeks later with a completed score of songs and the book. He was impressed by that. What was that called? Well, it was, of course, one of the billions of never produced musicals because it was way too expensive. It was a musical called Pirates, and it was about the uh, story of Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, who were two of the first women pirates. Now, since that time, it has now been shown that that was actually a novel written by Daniel Defoe under an assumed name. And so, but it was a great story of these these two women who decided for reasons of their own that they needed to become men. And so it's kind of a very (laughs) timely thing we're talking about it now. But anyway, nothing came of the musical. I was signed to a deal at... uh, But it shows your prowess. So that you were proactive. Oh. Reminds me, me, I'm sure, of the Pete Townsend story where the Who show up and, and, and they're like, you know, your guys are good, but you need to write your own songs. Right, exactly. And then two weeks later, he comes back with three hit singles. And the same thing happened with the Rolling Stones, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're, it's okay to, to do these Lennon and McCartney songs, but you should write your own. And they did. Yeah. Well, that was it. And so uh, nothing happened with that, but at the company, Essex Music, there was a very nice guy called Don Paul who was a uh, record producer. He was one of the professional managers, but he came up to me and said, uh, hey, Richard, you, you can write for strings, can't you? And I said, well, yes, I can, because I, I had studied there. I knew how to write big orchestrations, not that I'd ever heard them played, <laughs> you know, because you couldn't at Berkeley. You could hear your big band charts played, but that was about it. He said, well, I've got this guy who wants to make a disco record, and uh, will you do it? And I said, okay. And I wasn't crazy about disco music. I liked some of it. But then I said to him, well, I, sorry, yeah. He said, well, he'll pay you 400 pounds cash. Now, this was 1975. That's a lot of money. It That's was, a brand new car. It was, it was like about 5,000 yeah. pounds, 400 pounds. <laughs> I said yes in a nanosecond. Yeah. And I walked into the studio. Luckily, I had a good fixer because one of the musicians that I'd met, Lawrence Juber, had told me about this fixer who was happening in London. And I had a great string section and harp because I always like writing strings with harp. And uh, it's just a quirk of mine. Every record I've ever done that has strings on it has harp. And I was nervous, as you would be on your very first <laughs> recording session in Absolutely. your very first professional studio. Yeah. And I brought my shaking hands down and it sounded fantastic. It's, and, and you know, I was... Who was the artist? What was the song? I completely don't remember. <laughs> yeah. I was young. I was 24 years old, and I was being given more money than I'd ever held in my hand before. Incredible. So I, I didn't know. I just did it. And, and the producer was happy. The musicians were, were very happy, because when I walked in, you know, in those days I had no beard, and I looked way younger than I was, even though I was, I think I was... 24, yeah. But I, but I looked about 19. Mm-hmm. And they said, who is this kid, this long-haired kid? You know, I, I was still kind of a 70s hippie kind of guy. And, they, and then they said, wait, this looks hard. Does this kid know what he's doing? And then they played it, and it sounded fa- fabulous. And so then suddenly all the musicians started recommending me for work to their other producers who they worked for. And... This producer who I just worked for hired me for about six more projects. And suddenly I started getting calls. You're now an arranger. And then I got a call about a few months later from EMI Music. And they said, we'd like, to be, we'd like you to be our arranger producer for all of our artists. For, to, for, for, because they made demos, you know. And every publishing company had a studio underneath their, their uh, building. And uh, so then I got to work for about six months with a fantastic engineer who, who was happy to teach me everything about what he was doing. And I had all these songwriters coming to me and I'd say to them, okay, well, this verse is just terrible. Get rid of that verse. And you can't start the song like this. You need some kind of an intro. And, you know, and I'd tell them what to do and they'd agree. And that, that I found amazing, but they just said, fine, you know, we'll do what you say. So I had this great experience of doing it, perfect way to start a career as an arranger. And if I wanted a horn section, great. If I wanted to hire a band, 
EMI would pay for it. So I was in dog heaven. So, and then one of the musicians on the session who I used was a trombone player uh, whose name was Derek Wadsworth. And he was a very well-known arranger on the scene, an older guy. Uh, he would probably have been in his late 40s or early 50s at that time. But he came up to me and he said, man, these charts are great. He says, would you be interested in helping me with a project? And I said, well, what is it? He says, well, Cat Stevens is producing an enormous double album for his brother who's written this concept album. And I can't do all these arrangements. And it's all for big choirs and orchestras and you know, all kinds of things. And so will you do half and I'll do half? And I said, sure. So now I was working with an artist whose work I loved, Cat mm -hmm. Stevens. I loved his songwriting. I loved his singing. And that got me into a whole, that really got me started in terms of, you know, making a name for myself. And I, uh, I couldn't have enjoyed it more. I learned so much about production from Cat Stevens. Now, a lot of people will say, what on earth does he mean? But I'll, I'll tell you, and I think it's an important point to make because a lot of people, you know, when you talk about production, a lot of your, a lot of your discussion is about the technology. And that's fine, and that's important because it's like, it's like, what kind of strings do you use on your guitar, and and uh, what pickups are those? Those aren't normal Gibson pickups, are they? You know, that's fine, but <clears throat> it's it's like a paintbrush. You know, the paintbrush isn't so important. Sure. It's the painting that's important. Yeah, the creativity and so, is the biggest thing. So, this album, Cat Stevens was producing all of these different artists. Uh, from different genres, David Essex sang on it, uh, Gloria Jones sang on it, it was fantastic. Um, all these different people. And I noticed, I could not help noticing, that with one artist he'd be, oh, very quiet and spiritual and, and very, mm. he'd speak in a lower voice. With another artist he'd be telling fart jokes. Right, right. And, and I asked him about it after <clears throat> a while, I said, well, you know, Steve, what's, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, that's, that's called record production because my j job is to get the best performance out of these people as possible. And if they need fart jokes, I'll tell them fart jokes. If they need the Holy Scripture, that's what I'll give them. If they need the Buddhist thing, I'll do that. Whatever it is, you know, if they need me to flirt with them, I'll do that. Whatever I need to do to get them to give an incredible performance. And that is one of the best lessons you can learn That's about why production. why I always recommend Phil Ramone's book. Right, Making right, Rackles, yes, yes. it's all about psychology working <clears throat> with Absolutely, it's a, great, it's a great book. Yeah. And, uh, Agreed 100%. So it's the thing that I learned from that. And, and, uh, That's amazing, absolutely and, amazing. And, and another thing I learned from him, which was, I mean, I'm talking about him a lot because he was, he's just an incredibly talented guy. He, he used to invite me over to his flat uh, and at, just for pizza, you know, to hang out after the session and talk about stuff. And I said to him, uh, Steve, would it be okay if I sang you my songs? Because I've got a bunch of songs and, uh, you know, I'd just love to have your opinion. So I had this whole collection of songs, which were kind of comedy songs. Comedy has been a big, you know, area of my songwriting for years, as you'll learn if you listen to the Banzilla album. Um, so, so he... Um, he sat me down and I just played the songs and we ate pizza and his advice was just incredible. And one of the great pieces of advice he gave was, you don't always have to sell everything. Just say it with the correct emotion for that thought. But you don't have to be pushing it and, you know, all this. He said, just, just do it and make the audience come to you. Make the listener on the record come to you. Mm -hmm. He said, that's why... You don't have to have your vocals really loud. You know, if they're too loud, the audience is going to, you don't want them to do that. He said, you have to have the vocals just right, like it's in the thing. And he says, that's a delicate thing of mixing. And, and he said, it's just understanding that. That's powerful. He has so many songs that are like such huge statements, you know, whether it be Peace Train or singing about his relationship with his father exactly. and how the roles reverse. I mean, he's got like almost iconic songs that you, you, you can't help watching a movie without it coming absolutely, out. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you, I mean, it was, I 
feel very fortunate to have been in his presence and working with him, and also to get kind of a master class in songwriting, you know, and he'd take me through certain things I did in my lyrics, and he'd say, yeah, that's, that's great, that's very, that's, but this thing, it's pushing too hard. Don't mm. go all the way, you know, don't, just bring them in, make them, he said, always leave them with a little question mark. It's, it's like a, a TV series, you know, you don't want to just end it and, you want to keep the conflict up. What's going to happen next? What's, you know, is this guy in danger? So that's the thing that he showed me at that early age, and I was very grateful for it. We could, we could talk for hours on that alone. <clears throat> yes. You know, because his, his vocal delivery is oh. so, like, almost understated, but his lyrics are so powerful and so, like, boom, you hear them. Straight away, you know what he's he, trying to tell he you. He actually sang as as if he were speaking to you, mm -hmm. as if he was right next to you with his arm around you speaking to you. So that was amazing. When my father died, I remember going back to that song. And, mm. you know, I, if, I, if I think about it now, I'll start crying. Right, it's right. Such a powerful song. I and that's know. the beautiful thing about what music can do mm -hmm. for us. And that's the thing that I sadly feel if you listen to pop radio is not there. Here are the reasons why that's happened. Number one, radio formatting has destroyed originality. Because if you have to write to a formula, you're immediately no longer a creative artist. You're just a craftsman. Oops. All right, but that's it. Songwriting, because of that, has changed that it's songwriting by committee. I do not believe you can come out with a great work of art with six people in a room. It just doesn't work like that. That's not it. And, and that's not necessarily songwriting. Somebody coming up with a bass riff, yeah, maybe that's part of songwriting. But songwriting used to be defined by the law as lyric and melody. Lyric and melody, that's it. The lyric and the melody. So now, what's happened, and they had to change the law because they had to get around that. They changed the law when the Pharrell Williams case came in, where suddenly it's not just the lyric and the melody, it's the feel of the track. Now, as an arranger, uh, I have always felt that many times, as an arranger, I have contributed important melodies for songs, which are hooks, additional hooks. I had a long talk with Arif Martin about this very topic. And, you know, he said, because of his position, if he did something like that with a track, he would get writing credit for coming up with that important thing. But that's, he said, I only got that because I'm Arif. He said, if, you know, ordinary, Arrangers don't get that. So arrangers get no credit for that. They get no royalties on records unless they've conducted the records because arranging is not considered to be a performer. So if you're the guitar player on a track, you're going to get royalties. But if you're the arranger and you don't conduct it, you're not a performer, so you get no royalties. So, you know, you get a, a relatively small fee, small based on who you are in your career. I'll get more than Joe Bloggs and, and uh, you know, some, some big guy will get more than I do. But still, it's not a good situation because I believe, and I'm, I'm absolutely sure you're going to agree with me because mm -hmm. I, what I, the little I know of you is this, that making records is a team effort. Absolutely. And, and you know, everybody's important. And the record would not have come out that way if it were not for those contributions. Now, in some times, for instance, Jack Nietzsche is one of my favorite of the pop arrangers because of his contribution to the different records. And, but he got, he got arranging credit, which was very rare, but, you know, he got no royalties. It was still working on a fee, you know. And so, so we have to look at that and say, is that really right and is that fair? And if I, if I write a really important hook, like for instance, I always give the example of Dancing in the Street. Mm -hmm. ba -ba -ba -da -da -ba. Who wrote that? Not the writers, not the songwriters. Uh, sure. So Paul Reiser wrote, wrote it, he was the arranger. 
But that is a tremendous hook that brings you into the, as soon as you know that, that you hear that, you know it's dancing in the streets. Sure. So should he not get a co-writer credit for that? I think so. Yeah, I think the world of sampling has completely changed everybody's perception. Yes. Um, I think the most famous case, of course, uh, is um, The Verve. Because you have the last time, you have Andrew Luke Oldman's version of the last time. Exactly, exactly. And so the Verve take that and then write a brand new song over that. Yes. No, if you muted the strings, nobody in the world would think that has anything to do with the last time. Um, just factually, but because it was the basis and, the, and, and a big hook of the song. Right. The Rolling Stones become a writer of a track that is actually an arrangement, a rearrangement of one of their songs. Yes. Which is... Uh, yes, and who wrote that string line, I'm wondering? Who, who actually was the arranger on, on the last time? I actually uh, don't know. Who, well, there you go. There you go. I don't uh, know who the arranger was. And that guy was. just gets chucked in the dustbin yeah. of history, whereas, you know, we, we know about Andrew, but we don't know about... Right. Yeah, so that, that's part of the problem. And, and it's just not, it's not fair. And the Stones own that rearrangement of that. It's, well, it's a know, very complex an, yeah, web. Yeah, and another example of that is that... Although it was know, recently I, resolved. Sorry to interrupt you. Was, but that it? was recent. Yeah, I think, I think that the Stones gave back the songwriting entirely to uh, the Verve. Oh, well, that was yeah. nice of them. They, I, I mean, they, what they should have done is given it to the, given it to the arranger, but then that's right. just my opinion. Outside of arrangements, there's so many. There's, of course, uh, Andy Summers with oh, yeah, uh, that's, that's Every a, Breath You Take. Yeah, that, I talk about that in my book and, and uh, his there's, comments um, on that. There's Herbie Flowers, Walk on the Wild Side. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. With yeah. the bass line. Yeah. And they all came about because of sampling, because people would sample those key moments of the songs, maybe rap or write a new yes. song over them. yes. But the, only Sting or only Lou Reed was getting the income from it. Yes, indeed. Well, it's just it's just the way it is, and I I think that that has to be resolved because it's really interesting what happened with the with the Pharrell and Williams case. They said, okay, the feel and the rhythm arrangement of the track is part of the song, so therefore we own it. Right. So, but and yet the ara actual arranger on that song is not mentioned. It's just said the song, because the songwriter owns every scrap of the arrangement. Now, what I was going to bring up before was I've done a lot of work for the Pet Shop Boys and I've enjoyed every minute of it. And I've done big orchestral things for them. I've done, a, you know, a lot of stuff. I did, one of the first tracks I did for them was Left to My Own Devices. Now, the entire intro of that record, it's got kind of a minute and a half of an intro. There was nothing there except big chords. Boom, 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 boom. And maybe a little sequencer going on or something, but, but that was all it was. And they said, okay, so this is left clear for an orchestral introduction. So I wrote the, you know, and I wrote this big thing. So in the sheet music that is printed in the book, there are two pages of my writing. And it says at the top, written by, Neil Tennant and Chris Lowe. Is that fair? I ask myself. No, and I love those guys, but I'm just saying that's the, the arranger's lot. So, you know, the arranger is part of the production. The, and in some cases, very important to the production because music is very important and we, we're still dealing with notes. All of this stuff helps you make the notes sound good. Mm -hmm. All of it. Yep. And without that, you know, without somebody getting just the right sound on each instrument and balancing them in the right place, it's going to sound like doggy do. So, so I, you know, I have always throughout my entire career loved uh, the engineer. And sure. I've, you know, been friends with them and I've talked to them about what they do and whatever. But, you know, what they have to deal with is, all, is also, you know, tremendous... There, there was a, a producer that, that we worked for who said, I want the strings to sound like this. And it, what could he say? He said, okay, oh yeah, I see what you mean. And did what, what was right. Sure. But those are the things, yeah. So, so the music business has changed and, and uh, the whole concept of writing songs that you have to have parameters 
you can only have four chords and they have to be this list of four chords. And if they're not included in the, that list, you can't have them. No, no, no. That's out of the... That, any kind of, of uh, conformity is bad for music. And I agree with you wholeheartedly. Where is, you know, where's the Bob Dylan of today? Where's the, where's, where's the uh, Pete Townsend of today? You know, they, where are these innovators? I think one thing, and, and I'm agreeing, I'm sure everybody is agreeing with everything you're saying. I think one thing that's really important for us to recognize is we've both worked in the music industry at a high level. I've worked with every major label. And yes. I've produced, but I've also engineered under a lot of very famous producers right. and recorded. And I would say I've never been in a situation where I've been actually been leveraged by any label, maybe once or twice um, to get rid of mistakes and stuff like that. Right. Most of what we're talking about is the creation of the creatives themselves. So you're in a room these days, and I've been in these rooms with writers, and they're listening to the top 10 to guide them on That's what right. they should write. That's right. So this sort of, because I think it's very easy for creatives to be like, yeah, the big bad music industry. And God, what I see every day, I see a hundred rant videos. Well, I don't blame the industry at all. I, yeah. bl I blame- It's the up to in us as creatives. I, I agree, but it's all, I also blame the infrastructure. So that's an important point. So if you have a market where you're selling vegetables and you've only got three carts, you can't get that many vegetables on it. But what they've done is they've taken what was in the 70s, maybe 500 carts, and they've whittled it down to three. And, you know, that's pretty much an accurate analogy for the music business. It's not the business that has done this. It is the infrastructure of the business. In other words, they have found, I mean, streaming, I've got a lot to say about streaming, but <laughs> s streaming could have been a good thing, just like digital music could have been a good thing. When uh, I remember that when I was working with EMI, I had a, a girl called Celia, who was an artist who I produced and did three albums with them. I was talking to the head of the company and he was all excited because they were just bringing in the CD. The compact disc. And I said, oh, great. You know, and of course I knew what it was because I'd been working in studios. And I said, well, are, are you going to, uh, you are going to bring in copy protection on the discs. He said, oh, no, no, we're not doing that because uh, first of all, it'll take us at least another eight months to get the technology to get the copy protection on all our production plants. And he said, apart from that, you know, it's just, nobody's going to be copying compact discs. It's too expensive. People won't have that in their homes. That's only something that'll be in, in expensive studios, but every ordinary people won't have it. I said, man, <laughs> you're going to have that literally two months after you release the compact disc on the public, they're going to have bootlegs. And you're going to be beset by bootlegs and you're going to be in big trouble. And he said, oh, well, that's, you know, that's because you're just a producer. You're just a, an arranger. You're, a, you're too musical. He said, you don't understand the business. It'll never happen. And of course, I saw him six months later at an industry do and I said, I told you so. And he blanked me and walked away. So that's, that was one mistake. Then streaming. You cannot give music away for free. You can't do it. That ruins everything. Because then music becomes worthless. I've always been told this from the very beginning when I started in the business. Don't work for free. Don't ever work for free. I mean, it's okay to do it for your sister or something. It's okay to work for free for your wife. But don't work for free for a record company. Sure. Or for, or even for a producer, or for don't do because they if they don't pay for it, they don't value it, and that's that's just the truth. And so they devalued music in the in the uh, mind of the public, and that's not a good thing. People, I mean, you and I, you're not as old as I am, maybe, but here's the deal: you and I used to go out, we'd get our records, and we'd read every note of every every word of the liner notes. We were interested in not only what the artists had to say, but how they said it. 
And we wanted to look at those pictures and, oh, is so-and-so, what is he wearing there? What, what's he got in his hand? I thought he didn't smoke. I mean, those are all the things that we as fans, and we loved the music so much, we wanted to know about that. Nowadays, with streaming, you don't have that, uh, you don't have liner notes, you don't have the, the visual contact, you don't, and, and then let's talk about the way the business is for touring. First of all, up and coming bands, man, you would, you would agree with me on this, that they are the life's blood of, of any creativity. Where can they play for money? They can't. So if they can't play for money, they have to drive an Uber or a Lyft instead of working on their music all the time. That's not good. You know, when I, I, I sound so much like an old fart, but <laughs> in the 70s, you could get gigs, pub gigs all the time. The 70s and the 80s, pub gigs, and you'd make a living on that. Not a great living, but a good living. You know, you could, you could actually pay your rent and you could do the next gig. Pfft, you can't do that now. Nobody will pay you. Everybody wants you to pay for free. Everybody wants you to do all that. So it's not a good thing. So something has to change. And, uh, you know, the online thing can work. The people, I mean, I love what Wolfpack did. I absolutely, those guys knew what they were doing. They knew how to use the system. Uh, but not everybody can do that. So, yeah, it's a, it's a different world and an interesting world. And there are so many great creative artists coming out, not in the pop world, I wouldn't say, but in the kind of fusion-y world of uh, this jazz fusion, classical fusion, uh, you know, all these different other areas. I love what's going on. I listen to all, as much stuff as I can listen to. There's incredible stuff happening in the Brazilian world. And, all of that music. I hope it gets a chance to breathe. I think uh, the thing I find myself using as an answer all the time when people ask me pretty much questions about how to develop themselves as artists, as mm. creators, producers, mm. I'm like, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Yes. It's, you know, all the music that you and I grew up listening to continue to hold in such high regard is when you blend ideas together. Absolutely. I think one of the disadvantages and the advantages is the same thing of access now. If you're already educated on music, this is the best time to be in the music because I can just go, I want to listen to, and within nanoseconds, I'm listening to anything. Yes. And I'm blessed. Yes. I grew up in classical and jazz and metal <clears throat> and blah, 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 every right. genre. I can find it. But if you're, if you're not educated, it's, it, it's really hard to, you know, to, if you haven't been exposed to different genres, to, you can just get into like a very specific genre. Right, right. Agreed, um, agreed wholeheartedly, yes. Radio is a big thing. I've talked about this many times. When I first toured America, I went to Florida and I played a show. Some kids got backstage and I said to them, what bands are you into? And this is only like 15, 20 years ago. And they said, we listened to Leonard Skinner and like American, like, right, know, like right. rock of that period. And I was like, oh, that's cool. I was like, you know, do you like Otis Redding? And the guy looked at me blankly and said, who's that? Exactly the same experience I've had, yes. I'm just like, how can you, yeah. how can you not know who Otis I know, Redding's? I once asked a class that I was teaching. I said, raise your hands if you, you know, if you like various types of music. And most of them said R&B. I right. mean, there was a big, it was a big class I was teaching. 200 That's a good people, thing. <laughs> and they, yeah, and yeah. I said, okay, great. Then I said, how many of you have, can can name more than three songs of Aretha Franklin. Three hands went up. I said, how many of you can name more than three songs of James Brown? Pretty much the same hands went up. Unfortunately, the young listen to playlists now, not music. They just put on that alternative rock playlist and they listen to whatever it is. So yeah, it's a it's a tough thing. And and uh, uh, artists who come to me and want me to produce them and want me to work with them, I ask them, their, their frame of reference is so tiny, so microscopic, and it's all within the last three or four years, and that's it. That's all they know. And that's not good. The whole thing about music and the thing that makes you a producer is the fact that you have a huge frame of reference. And, you know... If somebody comes to me and says, oh, I've got this record, what should I do with it? I say to them as an arranger, well, you know, it can be done like this. 
and then you'll have this. So you'd be fusing with this kind of thing and you give it, or you could do it if you want a different thing, you could go for cheesecake and it would be, then you'd use this. So I have that frame of reference, obviously. Mm -hmm. The artists are not getting that. And yeah, the people who are lucky enough to go to Berkeley or go to any of these music schools, they, they get some of it, and, but then they also get, uh, in my book on Pat Metheny, the Pat Metheny interviews, he says, the problem is that there are so many musicians with so much technique, way more technique than we had, but they don't know what to do with it because the actual music that they're playing is, it's not doing anything. It's not saying anything new. It's not saying anything that's personal to them. It's just, look at how fast I can play giant steps. Or, you know, look, I can, I can play this solo by the slash, you know, watch, it's perfect. Okay, but you see what I mean? I mean, that's not a well, good place. One of the beauties of us growing up in a pre kind of digital world is that you could only do your interpretation because now you can find everything out. You know, mm, mm. Um, I remember when I learned my first one of my first like proper guitar parts I learned was needle and a damaged done on acoustic guitar, mm. and I took my granddad's um, you know record player he'd given me, and I just played it at a sixteen RPM, Good so it was idea. one octave yeah. lower, and I got my version of it, which yeah. is probably not correct but it's yeah. as close as I could get and then of course as I started to develop as a soloist I could listen to Jeff Beck at half speed yes and do my best to figure out his in in, in the way he would bend notes and his expression oh my god yeah but I couldn't do it exactly now I can learn it exactly oh absolutely of course god sure. bless digital for that but the problem yes. is is like yes. my interpretation and other players better players than me obviously their interpretation is what makes them so unique that's right that's right and and as pat says you know having something to say and it's and it's something to say either from your own heart or from the that's something that you want to say about the spirit of the times mm -hmm. so we're going through this is really blows my mind we are going through some of the worst times socially politically that I can imagine, I mean, I'm a student of history, so, you know, this is quite a dark, terrible time that we live in, and yet, where's the music? Where are the songs? It completely shocks me and makes me angry that there aren't songs that are protesting this incredible swing that our culture has made to unfairness, unkindness, violence, it's, I mean, let's not get started on the political thing, but I'm just saying it's shocking that there are not people writing, you know, where's, where's the Bob Dylan writing songs about that now? Right. Even he isn't. Yeah. <laughs> what I will say is that on my Banzilla album, which I gave you, yeah. there are two protest songs. One of them's called You Can't Get There From Here, yeah. and the other one is sung by Leo Sayer, Oh, I'm a huge uh, Leo Sayer. Oh man, well you'll love this one. It's it's yeah. uh, it's called "This World Is Mine," yeah. and I think that one is particularly apt when we're talking about protesting the state of the world because what it says is, "All right, if if this is the way the world's going to be, I've created my own world, mm -hmm. and it's in here, and this world is mine. You've never given me your world, so." Leave me alone. That's what the song says. And I think you'll really love it. And I asked him to sing it in his thunder in my heart voice, hmm. which was one of my favorite records that he did. And I was his musical director for quite a while. And I, and I did his TV show. I was so lucky to be able to be with him uh, to do that, that series, a TV series. Incredible. And hear him all the time, you know, working with him very closely. And He's such a nice guy, but at, at the same time, he's really committed to all this stuff we're talking about. Mm. And uh, I, I have to tell my Leo Sayer story. Please. I was, I, Leo impressed me as an artist because the first time I was asked to do his series, he said, come to New York. I'm doing a gig. I, before you do the series, I want you to see me live and see my show because then you'll really get an idea of what I want to do in this series. 
So I said, great. You know, so he flew me to New York, put me up in a nice hotel. We went to the, got, got into the limo to go to the gig. And the gig was outside of New York, about probably an hour and a half up, upstate in a rather large uh, theater kind of, it had a stage in the round that was going to go around. And a, he had a great band as he always had. And we drove up to the venue and we were kind of surprised that there weren't any lines or people or whatever. And the, the promoter came out of the front of the house and said, look, I'm very sorry, but something got messed up with the promotion. The ads didn't go in the, in the papers and they ne were never sent out. We've only got 100 people here. And it was like a 3,000-seater. So he said, uh, I, I, I'm sure you'll want to cancel the performance and we'll, we'll give these 100 people or so back their money. He said, give them back their money, but I, I'm going to do the show. So he got up on stage and people were sitting around, you know, all around this. It was in, in the rounds. So they were all over. He said, I want everybody to come and sit right down here in the first three rows. And he said, stop this stage tur turning around. And I'm going to do the show for you. So he stopped it. He brought the band forward. He sat on the side of the stage. He jumped off it. He was singing to them individual. He was getting the girls out of the audience and dancing with them. He was uh, throwing a football with the guys. He was just unbelievable. You know, and he said, they paid for the, a great show, and I'm going to give them a great show. Now, that, that's being a real artist. So, I, you know, for, for me, once he did that, I was his, you know, that was respect. Yeah, I love that stuff. That's amazing. I'm glad to say that. Yeah, I've always been a huge, huge fan. Gilbert O'Sullivan's another one that I... Oh, I worked with him too, yeah. What did you do with him? Really great. I did a record that was produced by Graham Goldman. Oh, wow, Graham Goldman. Yeah, yeah, which was great fun. He was a terrific guy to work with too. Uh, but Gilbert O'Sullivan, man, that guy's talented. Incredibly talented. So talented. I just did the arrangements for this album and it was just great fun. Oh, yeah. uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, no, late 70s. I'm pretty sure that's what His it was. His song Nothing Rhymed is in my top 10 favorite songs of yeah, all time. Yeah. What a song. Uh, just a joy. Just a joy to do it when you have an artist like that. And he just sat down and was wonderful. Oh, he always sounded the same. It's a, He's another guy who doesn't sing like he's singing, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and I think there's a place for that too. There's a place for those kinds of singers. But you know, Gilbert O'Sullivan it was just like he was telling you his stories. Mm -hmm. That's it. And you wanted to listen, so that was great. And I also did Randy Edelman at at about that time, and that was that was fun too. And he was beautiful player, singer, lots of fun. 1975. Let's uh, go back a little bit of time. It sounds like, and I, I love this. Like you've got you're working and you're getting paid. But there's no like one big break. This is, you looking at this is literally like working constantly yeah. and just one thing leading to another. I think, I think it's because when you're talking about what my job was, it's not a question of a big break. It's a question of building brick by brick your, your career. And if, when you work for one artist, then a group of people get to know you and then you work for another artist and then, then that, that, that grows uh, gradually. And it was fine because the whole time I was working. I mean, I would, it's, it's shocking to think, but my phone didn't stop ringing from 1976 all the way up until, I would say, well, in England. I left there in 2012 and my phone was still ringing. But, you know, it was starting to ring less during uh, the end of the 90s. And then, you know, because the music business was changing then. Um, and the amount of money that record companies had for the kind of thing that I was getting hired for, one of the reasons why I didn't do more records as a producer is because I just simply did not have the time. I didn't have the time. And, and I was constantly being asked to do arrangements for people, you know, and so that was the thing. So it was, a, it was an interesting growth of career. And because of it, I got to work with so many great people and you learn something from each one of them. Because uh, when I work with people, I'm sure you're the same. 
you know, I'm asking, I'm interviewing them anyway. <laughs> how did you do this? What, what's this all about? What did you intend when, and how did you get this? I mean, that was just so much fun. And so, and, and the great thing is that they were willing, I mean, like when I worked for Ray Charles, man, I mean, you can't be with him and not ask as many questions as you can get away with. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, and I learned a lot from that. And uh, What did you ask him? I talked to him a lot about uh, what people expect him to do. In other words, he, he's a guy who invented his own persona. He did something that was completely unprecedented, the joining of religious gospel music with blues and jazz. Before Ray, people had not really done that. And I was talking uh, a lot to Jerry Wexler about that. You know, he took the word of the Lord, he said, and put it in the hands of the people dancing barefoot in the streets. You know, he, that's what Ray Charles was able to do. And it was a brilliant idea. And Ray's, uh, he said, I just, I, I love all that music. And I, my attitude was there was nothing stopping me, and I wanted to do that. So why shouldn't I? And he said, I don't know. People expect me to do Ray Charles. Luckily, nobody expects me to do something else other than <laughs> Ray Charles. So I'm, I'm happy being me. And uh, one of my favorite quotes is, be yourself. Who else is better qualified? I love that one. And, <laughs> and, uh, and that's Everybody what, else is taken. Well, that's, that's right. I think that's great advice for any artist. Because so many artists that I see now come to me and say, oh, what should I do? What should I do? I said, if you have to ask me, then you don't know. So listen to this, 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 and this, and then come back and tell me what you think. Oh, you know, I, I had a student who came to me uh, with this great production he had done. He said, what do you think? What do you think? I've invented a new style of music. I said, okay, great. And I said, have you ever heard Genesis? <laughs> and he went away and I said, have you ever heard Yes? He said, no. I said, go away and listen to those bands and come back to me next week. And he came back and he said, oh. I said, it's great what you've done, but now think about maybe not <laughs> doing exactly. And interestingly enough, he had come up with it without intending to. But still, if you don't listen to what's out there, you know, if you don't look at the street when you're crossing the street, you won't notice the car that's going to hit you. So be aware, be observant. So, yeah, I mean, it was just, I, I also learned about Ray Charles that he was not being handled in a way that was suitable for an artist of his magnitude. And this is, you know, from the nuts and bolts kind of side. But when I came on the thing, first of all, I was asked with a very good friend of mine, Phil Spaulding, fantastic bass player. Absolutely. Call, called me up and said, hey, Rich, I'm in the studio with this guy who's going to produce the next Ray Charles record, and th they're looking for songs. And I said, great. He said, I told them we had three songs that, we're gonna, that they would love. Mm -hmm. And I said, great. Now, at the time, I was away in Denmark producing a fantastic singer-songwriter called uh, Michael Ruff. And I was just finishing, in fact, that weekend, I was finishing up and I was going to fly home on Monday. I said, I'll be there on Monday. By Monday, we'll have three songs. Come over in the afternoon and we'll do it. And we did. And I, on, the, on the airplane, I, I wrote three ideas for songs. And uh, he had written some ideas. We got together and bang, we re recorded the songs demoed them in my studio and sent them to Ray. He loved them. And, uh, and that was so much fun to hear Ray Charles singing my lyrics. I mean, I can't tell you. That's one of the great moments of my career. Experience, yeah. yeah. And he said, I can't believe you wrote that shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was, it was so uh, funny. And, and, you know, he said, you know, you guys have written songs like I would have written if I was still writing songs. It sounds like you're talking about me. And I said, well, we, we listen to everything you've ever done, and we especially listen to the songs that you wrote when you were really young. He says, well, that's what's great about it. So that was fun to do that. And uh, he suggested some things, and I think a key change, little things, you know. 
But that was fun. And then, of course, I arranged stuff for the album, uh, which was, again, totally fun. And uh, The songs made it to the record? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we wrote four, and four of them were recorded, and three of them made to the record. And the fourth one was great, too, but that I, I have a early version of it that it wasn't finished. Although it was kind of finished because there were strings on it. Yeah, but anyway, it was it, what, what an honor to, to be that, with that. And I used to just sit with him occasionally. There was also when I said, I didn't finish my thought, but when I said that Ray was not being handled very properly, he then called me to conduct a tour, a European tour that he was doing. And he said, I want to use, I'm going to use my rhythm section, but I want to use your horns because he had heard my Banzilla stuff. So I said, great, terrific. So as the gig is approaching, the first gig, I said, where are the, what songs are we doing? What's, what, can you send me a set list? And, and uh, his office said, there is no set list. He calls the tunes on every gig. I said, oh, well, can you send me a recording of some of the recent concerts? He said, I can, but the, the song list changes every night. So I said, okay, well, at least I'll have the charts on the gig. So I got to the gig. The guys are passing out parts to the band. And I said, where are the scores? Oh, the manager will not allow him to take his scores on tour. I said, why? Why would that happen? He said, well, he thinks that if the scores are there, they'll be stolen and somebody will steal the Ray Charles sound. And, and I said, <laughs> so I went up Ray to, Charles is the Ray Charles sound. <laughs> and that's what I said to Ray. Yeah. I went up to Ray and I said, Ray, there's no charts here. I have nothing to conduct with. And I don't know what tunes are being played. And, and by the way, when Ray called the tunes, he didn't say, Georgia. He said, 95. So he called all the tunes in numbers. He knew they had 600 arrangements. And he knew every song of the 600 arrangements by number. This guy's, you know, he was, as they say, a wig. Yeah. So anyway, so then I said, Ray, and he said, well, he thinks they're going to be stolen. That's the way it is. He said, but don't worry, because everybody has to, you know, all the conductors I use have to, you know, put up with this. They have to work without a chart. But he said, you know, you're a great guy. Don't worry, you'll get it. So, <laughs> so I said, okay. So the first gig, of course, I didn't know what to do. That luckily, the drummer, who was a very nice guy, said to me, look, the only thing you can do to not look like a total idiot on stage is Ray is sitting at the piano. He's sitting on, looking at the stage, the left. And his, he said, watch his right leg because he counts in every tune with his leg. So all you get is four. So one, two, three, four, one. So now you know where the downbeat is. I said, thank you for that. And so that's all I did. All I did was I watched his leg, and when he went up, I went up, and then I came down. At least I got the downbeat. Then I had to wing it. If I knew the song already, I could maybe, you know, but I, I felt like an idiot. So now the second gig, he did a couple of the same songs. Now I've got it in my head. I've, I've listened, I've memorized some of the charts and whatever. So by the, by the fourth gig, or maybe it was more, maybe it was the sixth gig, we did Glasgow. That gig was for the BBC, it was being recorded by the BBC. Now, I had been a BBC broadcaster for 20 years. So I, I knew that real well, I was at home now. So I got my musical associate, from the BBC. And I said, when we do the rehearsal, I want you to bring along a photocopy machine. What? I said, I want you to put the photocopy machine outside of the rehearsal room. Okay. I said, now, as he calls out number 243, I want you to pass out the parts, but I want you to take the piano part. If you can get the piano part and hand it to a little guy, get yourself a little guy who can go outside, photocopy the piano part and bring it back to you and then give it to the piano player. 
So now he had photocopies of all the charts that Ray called on that night for that performance. And I was in heaven. Now I had everything. I knew what was going on and I had the arrangements. So at the end of the gig, uh, I've got a picture on my website of it. You know, Ray's giving me a hug and shaking hands. And uh, he said, wow, well, that was a great gig. You see, I told you you'd get it. <laughs> we connected because your name had come up. I obviously knew who you were anyway. Oh, yes. We should talk about yeah. Slave to the Rhythm, I yeah. think. Um, but also Hugh Padgham. Hugh Padgham talked about you. Really? Yeah, because, because um, I think we were talking about ABC. We touched on it because we, Hugh and I had, I mean, how many interviews did we do? Three. And each one was like three hours long. Right. right. So we just, you know, Hugh's one of my favorite producers and engineers yeah, of all yeah, time. Yeah. And, and I um, just made some of the best sounding records. Yes. And so we would go on all kinds of tangents just talking about that period, yeah. which to me is still my favorite period of, of well, music. Well, ABC, ABC was kind of interesting because it was produced by Bernard Edwards. That was a great fun thing to I've work. done three videos on Chic. So oh yeah, I'm well there huge, you go. Okay. Huge fan, yeah. Well, he he was great and uh and I was really looking forward to it just from the point of view of working with him, but he was incredibly I mean, he just said go for it. Do whatever you think. Get, give, you know, just don't bore me. And so we did that and uh he did that thing which is some people do and I actually don't like the sound of double tracked strings. I've never liked it because it does something to make the string. They always think it's going to make the string section sound bigger. It doesn't because the, the whole thing about recording strings in a room is you've got all these very complex sure. harmonics. An engineer friend of mine explained it to me that you've got all the complex harmonics of the mics up in the room. And that's what makes it sound magic and bright. And the minute you start double tracking strings, it for me it just makes it sound like uh, a bad organ anyway he wanted to track the strings and of course i said well you know it's going to cost more money if you do that he says don't worry about it i i've done this a million times before so he says to the guys yeah i that take was good but i think we need another one let's just do another one from the top and of course he used the double track. Uh, <laughs> but apart from that... That's an I, old trick with, with string string players because of union rates and stuff. Like, oh, there was a mistake in the bridge of one here, so let's yeah, do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard that and seen it many times. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually wouldn't mind it if it sounded better. It doesn't. But and, I agree with you. Double tracking the ambience doesn't yeah. make any sense. Now, on the other hand, double tracking the brass sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. And all of my... I'm, I'm rather well known for my brass writing. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, like Swing Out Sister and all that, Was Not Was, uh, those tracks, they're all done with a small section double tracked, kind of like what the Brecker Brothers did. And so, yeah, that's, for some reason, the, the, the uh, frequencies of brass instruments, especially trumpets, just, you know, it sounds great. And so on my new album, which I'm plugging like crazy, uh, it's, Plug away. It, it's three horns, and uh, it's John Thurkle who played on Breakout and about 50 other uh, major hit records. Played on Uptown Funk. And uh, so I've got trumpet, saxophone, and trombone as my front line. So, you know, of course I've tracked them and it sounds great. I wanted to keep it slightly smaller for the gigging idea because it's, you know, then I don't Are you to... playing live? Oh, I will be. I will be. Great. I, but we got to finish the record first. Where's your studio? Well, uh, my studio is at my house, but I don't use that for recording anything other than myself, some vocals and some solo instruments. I used to use it. It was kind of this size and I had uh, uh, a drum room and uh, I have a drum room and a piano room and, a, and another overdub booth. But I don't really use it so much for recording these days. I, I let other people, you know, and, and so many records, the Banzilla album was put together from people sending me tracks. And so it's the way it had to be. That's a lot of fun to do that. And uh, I foolishly still think I have something to say and I still think I can make people laugh a little bit. So I like to make these, these records. And uh, of course I like to whip out the guitar every once in a while too. Your name comes up a lot. Nice. Um, obviously with all of the British music from that period, of course. You're, you're on of course, yeah. tons of it. Yeah. Um, 
What was interesting about Slave to the Rhythm yes. is one of the things that I admire about that song is its constraint. And because it, it, it and one of those things, of course, is like when um, Steve would, Stephen was playing back the string arrangement, there's so much incredible stuff there that, you know, and he was admitting this could all be, there could have been another completely several different versions just using the string and there And there are, and I yeah. found a couple of them, and it was great to find them. In fact, I did a master class uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, on my work, and, and one of the sections I had was Slave to the Rhythm, and I thanked God and you, uh, <laughs> who may be the same person, I don't know. <laughs> uh, that Definitely not that you released your video that had the first time that I've heard my string arrangements uh, and brass on Slave to the Rhythm raw in that way without the track, because I can now really hear what I did. And there's so much of it. There's also a big, long uh, e uh, thing at the end, which was never released. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. 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 It's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's, it's Everything about that song. Well, it's interesting. Hmm is I went, Steve and I did the first interview and I said to him, Stephen, I really want to come back and just do Slave to the Rhythm. And he's like, why ever would you want to do that? Yeah. And he goes, it was never really a big hit. I said, you don't understand. For guys of my age group, the Gen Xers, this was a song that we all aspired to. Every musician, every engineer, every producer, every mixer I know, when that came out was like, what is this? And still is. And I've yeah. introduced that record to a lot of people. And every time they hear it, they hear me raving about the record. Uh, and then they kind of, you know, let it glaze over their eyes. And then they come back to me and they say, I just heard that record. <laughs> That's unbelievable. You know, so so that hits on every level. It's, yeah, yeah. It's what I probably, I'm sure yourself. We want what we want is we want it all. Yeah, and I I, <laughs> I think that that record I always quote it as being I think it is the apex of record production mm -hmm. because and they and they were lucky to have the freedom to do that. I mean, that's one thing he doesn't really talk about, but I think it's so important that they had 100 percent creative freedom. Mm -hmm. um, Chris Blackwell said. It, to Trevor, Trevor said, I'll do this if I can do whatever I want, completely whatever I want. Yeah. And Chris Blackwell said, fine. And that included not just doing one version, but into, when I came to it, there were 16 versions. Sure. Yeah. And I heard every single one of them. Yeah. And he said, okay, I'm, he, these are the eight that we've decided to pick to, to, to be on the album. I said, okay, great. And then he said, I want you to do stuff on these two tracks. And I said, okay, great. And he said, and I said, you know, what, what, what are you looking for? He said, impress me. We can nice. have whatever, he said, you can have whatever you want. And I said, does that include an 85 piece orchestra? Yes. Do I, whatever you want. That doesn't mean there's no, there's no restrictions. Do whatever you want. So then I decided, okay, Great. And he said, come to the studio and, and we'll go through the scores and, and you'll show me what you've done. And I said, great, I really want to do that. And this is where I take a little bit of issue with Stephen Lipson, where he says, I never played them. I didn't want to play. I wanted very much to play them what I've done or show them what I've done. So I was producing Dusty Springfield at the time, which is a whole nother story, but that was, oh, talk about so, that. so my brain was, was pretty sure. much involved in that, but I was finally got a date to come down to the studio. And this was the night before we were to record the first orchestral session for Slave to the Rhythm. So I walk into the studio and I've got my big case with my score and all the parts in it, because I was ready for tomorrow's session. And I walked in, and as I walked in, Trevor took it out of my hand and handed me a guitar. He handed me a Stratocaster. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, there's something wrong with the rhythm track. And I said, you guys are kidding. And I look around the room, and I, there's Andy Richards. There's Steve. There's Bruce Woolley. And there's Trevor on a SP-12 drum machine. That's what he's fooling around with. 
and that's the Synclavier, the Fairlight. Uh, Bruce Woolley was had his uh, his uh, I think it was a Roland synth. And I said, "Come on, guys, what, this is a fantastic groove." Now, yeah, but Trevor said, "But yeah, we think there might just be something wrong." And then when he said "we," that was slightly qualified because it wasn't. I don't think it was so much of a we. Sure. You know, Andy Richards looked like he would rather be having a nice cappuccino, and uh, <laughs> Bruce Woolley was not happy either. And it just generally the vibe was was uh, doom. And so that was six o'clock in the evening, six p.m. I believe it was two in the morning. <laughs> after trying every possible variation and me playing the funkiest rhythm guitar I could think of in different ways, finally. I said at two o'clock, I said, guys, I've got a session tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We're recording a huge orchestra at Angel Studios and I need to be there. I'm going home. I'm going to at least get a shower, maybe even a spot of breakfast. And then I'm going to the studio. See you there or not. So I went, I did what I said I was going to do, went to the studio at Angel Studios. And as I walked into the studio, Trevor's there, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. He looked like he's just had a six-month holiday in Jamaica. <laughs> and said, you know, you were right. There was nothing wrong with the track. It's, it's really great. But it was fun to try all that stuff, wasn't it? Well, I mean, there's, there's a massive lesson in that. <laughs> yeah, there was a massive lesson. I'm not even sure what it is. <laughs> but but, but, but no, don't pushing, say... Pushing don't, the boundaries. But don't say I didn't try to show yeah. them. that I had it all there. I was ready to spend some time showing them the arrangement. But yeah. no. So that was the thing. Well, your arrangement... I mean, I think Stephen's message on that was probably one of trust with the arrangement. I mean, by that point, 1985, you'd already done some. Oh yes, incredible yeah, that's right. Stuff. Yeah, sure, I'd worked with them before. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they, they knew that's why they called me. Yeah, they, they knew they, you yeah. were going to deliver. Right, exactly. But they and wanted, they wanted to see if you could, uh, you could beat the groove and come up with something funkier, and and well, you, you helped convince them. Yeah, yeah. That what yeah. they had was great. That's right. That's right. I mean, we just, we just, uh, he and I just did uh, relax. Ah, and that nice. was version three or four. I can't remember now off the top of my head. Yeah. They had fallen in love with something, and um, Trevor just, I think, you know, the first thing he brought Stephen in on and was just like, nah, start again. Yeah. And I, I, I love that. I, yeah. I love hearing stories of Eno with you 2 going, okay, we've been laboring this track for so long. Uh -huh. You all know it. Just go back in and recut it from scratch. <clears throat> right, right. You know, whether what, the, the but great you know production is that, isn't it? But Warren, I, I got fearless. I, I think is the word we're looking. For. Yes, fearless. And but Warren, in those days, you could be fearless mm -hmm. because the the goal of every producer and every artist was to do something different. And you've never heard anything like this before. Mm -hmm. And check this out, big boy. Yeah. But nowadays, that's not the attitude at all. That I, I've I've talked to uh, record pluggers. And they just say it's got to fit into the parameters. It's not, and and they they said record producers make records strictly to the parameters that we lay out on the for the formatting. So it's a different world, and I loved that world because it was creative, it was free, and it, you know, you and I are not just doing music for money. Right. Yep. Money's great. I like to be able to pay. You know, whatever, but. We're doing it because music makes us feel something. And I react to, when I work with an artist, whoever it is, and in whatever capacity, whether I'm the producer, the arranger. And you know, you say you've worked as an engineer strictly. We've both been very lucky to work with different producers. Yep. So I know that Chris Neal didn't work like Trevor Horn, mm -hmm. who didn't work like Arif Martin. Who did, you know, so I know the working methods of all these different guys. Mm -hmm. And so that's what's fun, is that you can learn something from each one of them. Oh, God. I mean, when I, did you work with Dave, David Foster? Ever work with him? I unfortunately did not work with him. I worked with David Foster. It was on a Diane Warren song. Oh, yeah. So I'm like terrified. Yeah. I'm going into, so I actually got into the studio three days before the session. Right. Canceled things around. Yeah, yeah. Went into a studio I'd never worked in and like got everything set up. The drum sound, the piano sound, everything. 
David said, this is the time I'm starting. Of course, he arrived like 15 minutes early, you know. <laughs> and I remember he said to me, the band we were working with didn't have a bass player, so we were going to overdub the bass player. He said to me, who do you know? I said, I've Sean Hurley. He's great. Great. So we bring him in, and in the time, in the 20 minutes that it took Sean to come from the other studio who was tracking at to get in there, David said to me, play the bridge. So I played the bridge, and he wrote the bass line that he wanted for the bridge in real time as it was going down. As Sean arrives, he goes, here's what I want you to yeah, play. Yeah, right, exactly. And right. I think that this is something that um, I had the same experience with Phil Ramon. Phil brought in the arranger and was like changing the chart yes. in real time with the orchestra there. Yes, yes. And this is something that you don't well, really know until you experience well, it. Well, that's right. And working I, and, at that level. And, and I, I've had few experiences like that, but I've had experiences where changes need to be made, and you have to do them quickly. Yeah. And thank God for the photocopy machine. I mean, <laughs> I, I got to the end of, um, I did this big, uh, I did Somewhere for the Pet Shop Boys, which is also one of my favorite pieces of work. And uh, at the end of it, there was just this fade out thing that went on for a while. And, and uh, Neil said to me, do you think you could write something over that? And I, and he said, well, I said, well, what, what are you thinking of? He says, I, I don't know, something kind of Gershwin-ish or something. And so I said, got it, no problem. So I wrote out this blues line. Well, for you're the, an American in London. No. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> So I, I wrote out this this blues line for, for the end of the well, thank God, thank God. Uh, <laughs> for the end of the track, and uh, I wrote it out, passed it out to the guys, and we recorded it. So those things can happen. What you know, you also get into situations where the producer. I'll just say this: I was in a situation where the producer was very. He was getting really pissed off that everybody was going crazy about my arrangement you know they were very complimentary and say oh that's gorgeous it's so beautiful it's so wonderful you know and i i felt that the producer was getting more and more antagonistic well just didn't like the fact that hey you're supposed to i'm the producer here so don't you know so there's you get run into that ego thing a lot too and I, that always I, concerns me because that just feels I've, I've experienced that as well um because you know when you come to a session and you're hired whether it be engineer, arranger, guitar player, whatever, mm -hmm. of course you're going to push the boundaries. I, I, I love, when I'm an engineer only, I'm helping the guitar player. Of course you are. And I'm sitting there, we're working on parts. Yeah, yeah, If yeah. the producer is threatened by it, then he really should hire a less talented person. You know? Well, yeah, there's that, there's that. Yeah. But, you know, that's, there, Gloria Swanson once said, great stars have great ego. And it's right. and it's just very true. <laughs> and they can be talented people with great ego, and people who are not talented with great ego. But you unfortunately, know, I found more of the latter. Yes, yes. I feel like the ego, you know, because working with like Jack Douglas and, and guys like that, he, he just wants the result. All he cares about is how good is Absolutely. it going to be. Yeah, and you know Quincy's thing about leave your ego at the door. It's so true. Leave enough room in the, in I, the room for God. Yeah. I I yeah. love it when everybody is going in the same direction and wanting the same thing. I'm a writer, so I write notes on the paper. I write drum parts very precisely. And, I, and, and everything, you know, everything is noted. However, however, if the musician thinks of something better, they know me. And I always say to them, if you, if you, if you can improve on what I've written, do it. Yeah. Because then you can play something great and I can take the credit for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Well, plus, plus, if they do something great, it it makes it better still because not only does the music better, but they, they get a bit more ownership yeah, of it. Yeah, and the more I, ownership they that's have, it, the that's more... right. Oh, yeah, of course you want that. And and I do, you know, sometimes if there's something specific that I know a guitar player can play in a certain style that I don't really play in, mm -hmm. and I don't really, I just say, look, I want you to do a, you know, a a Reggie something, you know, I want you to do that kind of thing. And they say, okay, got it, man. And they do it. So that's great too. I can do that. But I'm just saying you have to work with people who want to work together. Sure. Who not people who want to, I did that and I did that and I did that, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, but that's, that's, that's the business. But I, I can honestly say that 90% of the work that I've done throughout my incredibly overlong career has <laughs> been, has been positive and 
pleasant and uh, inspiring and uh, frightening and uh, joyful. I mean, it's just been great.